All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, as, as I was saying, uh, Michael Yellowbird, I'm dean and professor at the uh, University of uh, Manitoba, the Faculty of Social Work. And um, I am a member of the three affiliate tribes from North Dakota, but I live in Canada. Um, a lot of my work uh, started on mindfulness back in 1975 when I was an undergraduate at the University of uh, Minnesota in Crookston. I, uh, I was uh, always interested in meditation and mindfulness uh, for a long time. And uh, I had, of course, been through ceremony and learned how to sit still and learn how to listen and learn how to focus during ceremony, whether it was sun dance or whether it was whether it was a sweat lodge or pipe ceremonies or special kinds of uh, doings that were going on back home. Uh, so I, I uh, learned early about you know, the importance of, of stillness and silence, how powerful silence can be. And, um, and it, was, uh, it was really important you know, um, for me to kind of uh, start to uh, learn more about mindfulness because I had grown up in a community where there was a lot of uh, turmoil, a lot of challenges. I didn't grow up in a rich family or privileged family. You know, we were all, the time we were growing up in the 60s, the early 60s, we were all pretty poor folks, right? A lot of poverty, and, and, but there was a lot of love too as well, but there was also a lot of uh, breakdown in families. Um, and I was telling the last group I was with, I said, you know, I, <clears throat> I experienced a lot of, um, uh, exposure to death and violence as a kid. Uh, um, and I was uh, affected by that quite a bit. And that didn't happen just when I was a kid. That kind of went on when I was a young man, when I was uh, early, you know, um, uh, I guess in marriage and, and, you know, seeing a lot of things like this, a lot of alcohol, substance abuse. I came from a time in the 80s uh, when I was, uh, finished my MSW in the early 80s went back to work for my tribe, and um, uh, when you talk about substance abuse, some of, some of the guys, you know, my uncles and people I knew would be walking down the road like this in the wintertime, pick them up, and they'd smell like uh, aqua velva, shaving lotion. You know why, right? They're drinking it. They're drinking uh, shaving lotion and vanilla extract. and Some were even drinking uh, rubbing alcohol. They'd take the rubbing alcohol and they'd put it in a... Uh, container and then they put Kool-Aid in there and mix it up. They drink it. I never heard of that, some people, huh? That's, that was kind of going on when, uh, way back when, you know, when people didn't, couldn't uh, buy alcohol. In fact, when I was a, a human resources director, the tribal health director for our tribe, I worked with the city of Newtown. This was back in the 80s again, mid-80s, early 80s, with the pharmacists and the stores because we had to kind of move the uh, vanilla extract off the shelves because the boys were buying it, and they'd mix it up and drink it, right? So they were doing, you know, and then they went through that whole period of sniffing, right? You guys know about that? Yeah. Okay, yeah, sniffing and glue and gas and things like that, huffing. So that was kind of a, talk about pandemics. That was a pandemic back then in the 80s, you know. Kind of went into the 90s, and now today it's, you know, there's still issues, opioid use, uh, on our reservation, drug cartels come around the reservation. Um, you know, those kinds of things. A lot of things haven't improved. So when I was in school, I would have be thinking about things like that. It was always constantly on my mind, and uh, I didn't, I couldn't really study well. You know, because it was like when I would start to study and get frustrated, that that would sort of emerge, right? And I know why, because I'm I'm a very I'm a sensitive person, right? Not like some of these folks that are very real tough. They're very, you know, they can kind of withstand that kind of stress and those kinds of things and kind of move through it. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in just a minute about sensitivity. Anyway, I, I, I decided I wanted to try meditation. So uh, one weekend I was walking around with a friend in, in Crookston and we were uh, going to garage sales. And I walked to this garage sale and I found this book. I was looking at all these books, right? I'm quite a bookworm. I got all kinds of books in my library at home. And I found this book called How to Meditate by this guy named Lawrence Lachan, who was a, who was a, a really renowned psychotherapist in New York City. So he wrote this book about how to meditate. So I bought it. So I'd practice in my room. And my roommate would say, what are you doing? You know, I'd be sitting on my bed meditating. And when he was studying, I would get off you know, the, my, my bed and I would go into the shower. 
and I'd close the bathroom door, and I'd close the shower door, and I'd sit on my pillow, and I'd sit in the shower and meditate in the shower, right? So sometimes he'd come in and he'd look at me meditating like this, you know, wondering what I was doing. It was back in 1975. But I, I persisted because I had these memories. And uh, it's a lot, it was, it's, um, kind of precedes uh, mindfulness revolution that's going on now in, in the world. Everybody's doing mindfulness. Everybody's bringing mindfulness into treatment, into uh, education, into military, and so on, right? Into medicine, to health. Um, and uh, evidence base is really good. So I, I was uh, doing that kind of meditation. But I brought it, when I finished there, I, I went to um, uh, back home, and I, of course, saw this, and so I meditated. I was still kind of meditating at home. Then I went on to grad school at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. I continued to meditate. I was in graduate school. I uh, would meditate at home, meditate at school. Uh, just mostly quiet. And then when I uh, finally left the tribe in 1985, 86, I went to the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. I did my PhD there. And I really started meditating a lot there, a lot of meditation. And I started meeting people and training with people and so on back in uh, the late 80s, early 90s. And when I left Wisconsin in 1992, I went to the University of British Columbia as my first faculty position uh, at the School of Social Work on the uh, University of British Columbia campus. That's the first time, I, uh, second time I taught folks about how to meditate. There were kids on East Hastings in Vancouver. These were native kids. So they were coming to the uh, Aboriginal Friendship Center. One of my students was working there. And so she asked me to come down and work with the students. So I start teaching meditation to all these uh, Indian kids off the street. And they really liked it. I thought, wow, that's cool. You know, they liked it. So uh, I did that you know, kind of off and on until I left there in 1994. I went to the University of Kansas. And then I kind of slowed down in the classroom, but I continued to meditate. And then in the year 2000, when I was, at, I was a professor at Arizona State University, I brought meditation back into my classes again. And it was a big deal back in you know, 2000. The reporters came in, they were taking pictures of all the students meditating and all that sort of stuff. You know, what's going on? What was he doing here? But it was really effective because a lot of these social work students had to go out and work with people that were really challenged situations. Poverty, violence, on the streets, addicted to drugs. And of course, they were getting what they call that compassion burnout, right? Hard for them because they saw so much at that point. I hope this is my water. Somebody else's. Is- got lipstick on there. No, kidding. Just kidding. Um, so, you know, then, and then I started bringing it really kind of into uh, my practice in school. So when I was, uh, some years later, when I was at um, uh, Humboldt State University, I was a professor at Cal Poly Humboldt in uh, Arcata, California. Then I brought it really deeply into the classes, to undergraduate classes and to the uh, master's classes. And I actually started a program at the Yurok Reservation in Klamath, California on the reservation for kids there at their uh, Klamath River Early College of the Redwoods. It was a charter school, all these native kids. Well, there was, you know, mixed native and white kids, but mostly native kids. They loved it. It went really well, and they really got a lot out of it. And um, when I finally, um, the next time I, I, I continued to do talks like this, but then the next time I, I did it again was with uh, students on the White Earth Reservation at the Circle of Life Academy. We started a program there, kids over there. So I would drive from, I was a professor at NDSU at the time, I'd drive over to uh, uh, White Earth about two or three times a week to work with all the kids in the classes. Went really well. So um, I've been doing this now for for quite a while. And so what it's really done for me is it's uh, helped me to kind of, you know, really, really sort of stabilize the work that I do. And then of course to see and to kind of encourage um, health providers like yourself to kind of like take it on and to use it as a tool in healing and in helping and creating wellness. So that's when I first start doing it, mindfulness practices in 1975. Um, the, some of the things I'll just mention just briefly because last time I talked about it too long instead of doing practices. But the uh, really important thing to remember is, is that, you know, we as people, human beings, have a negativity sort of fallback, right? And what I mean by that is that for about 300 million years, 
if you look at evolution, 300 million years, let's see if I can get the right one here, 300 million years as we evolved as human beings before we had spines and before we were mammals, the, the brains of, of our ancestors, these little sort of, you know, um, um, creatures, you know, that, that didn't have spines yet, you know, uh, their, their consciousness and their brains, you know, were, were sort of uh, what evolutionary science says is that, you know, they were sort of um, built around the five F's. Fighting, uh, feeding, and these are like human being traits, right? Um, fearing, um, fornicating, and uh, let's see, freezing, I guess. Freezing meaning like, you know, just getting so scared that you freeze, the five Fs, or six Fs really, but, um, and, and so we spent, this is, was all key to our survival, believe it or not. Survival was based upon these traits, fighting with one another, with others, feeding, you know, and feasting as much as we could, you know, running away from things, right? Um, like fearing and fleeing, I guess is the other one, fleeing, instead of freezing, fleeing, running away. Fleeing, running away. It's kind of our, all, these are all our fallbacks, right? These six Fs here, but um, that was based upon our survival. Because of that, survival for all those years, doing those kinds of things, we have, you know, our fallback is negativity. So when I've been uh, writing and doing research, I came upon some research uh, by the National Science Foundation that said we have you know, as many as, you know, 20,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day, all of us, right? Somewhere in that range. Some are longer thoughts, sometimes are quick thoughts, whatever. But generally, that's kind of the, uh, the range that we're looking at. So as I was looking at this research and writing about it, you know, they, they said, you know, how many of these thoughts do you think are negative thoughts and are positive thoughts? What percentage do you think we're a pretty positive species or a pretty negative species or in between? What do you think? How many, how many uh, negative thoughts? We'll put N. What percentage? 80%. Okay, 80%. Okay. So um, that's negative. So that means positive equals 20%. Anybody else want to guess at it? Just a guess. 50? So, so, so someone's saying 50%. So one more guess, 70, 30. So the nurse wins. It's about 80% of our thoughts are negative thoughts. Imagine that. Negative. Wow. But that's because it's part of our survival. Negativity, being suspicious, mistrusting, you know, those kinds of things are all part of our negative hardware, right? right? You trust too much, someone's going to take advantage of you, right? They're going to steal your car, or steal your cell phone, or you know, steal your food, or whatever, right? And that's not to say humans don't have good qualities. I'm just saying that you know, those qualities are there, and that's part of the survival. I mean, if, if we were a species that were, were really good species, we wouldn't have laws about breaking and entering, about stealing, right? Those kinds of things. That's the one thing that kind of maintains society, our laws, right? Laws to make sure that people don't do those kinds of things. So if we have 80% of our thoughts that are negative, how many of those thoughts do we carry on to the next day? What percentage? What percentage do we carry on to the next day? 100%, 50%, 10%? 40%. So that's a guess. 40, 60, what else? 70. 70. 
Okay, this is kind of the closest right here. We're getting close to almost 90% of those thoughts that we had that are negative today. We're going to take them tomorrow. We're going to just carry them over to tomorrow, right? We don't want to carry them all because we want some new negative thoughts, right? You can't have just old negative thoughts. We want to have at least 10% new negative thoughts about something, right? This is how it works, right? And that's kind of the, again, that's what, the spe what happens with the species. So when we're negative, then it's more difficult to access that part of your brain that is, um, let me do this. Sorry, I got up to, to leave and I... I gotta take a, sorry, I gotta take a picture of this, folks. So people know I'm actually working here. Um, so, so then we, this is kind of like why the purpose of mindfulness is because negativity exists. And because negativity exists, it's hard to... Um, access that part of your brain where compassion lives, right? Remember I talked about that at the, my keynote? And why is that? Well, if you've, got, if you've got about 300 million years of negativity, and you've got 15 million years is what, um, what uh, um, evolutionary science says, 15 million years of practicing compassion Positivity, optimism, which one's going to win? You got more practice here, less practice here. It's, 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 it's a no-brainer. The more practice you do on being negative and being negative, the harder it is to access the compassion, positivity, and optimism in your brain. Now. I'm going to kind of go out on a limb again and say that that's normal when you've got about 80 to 85 percent negativity in a normal population. How about, on a, how about in a tribal community? Is it better? Are we better off? Are we better than normal? More positive? What do you think? I see some heads going like this. Nope. All right. That's probably true because of the trauma and the continued trauma that goes on easier to remain, to stay in that place. Why would, why would anyone be hopeful when all these bad things continue to happen, right? These challenging things happen, right? So that's the thing, is it's, it's more difficult, right? So when we've got that part of the brain to access, as I mentioned before, to access this part of the brain here requires us then to kind of slow down that part of the brain that is focused on Negativity, mistrust, denial, anything that goes along with a negative state, right? Withdrawal, right? Avoidance, uh, fighting, those kinds of things. It's, it's uh, we don't, again, let's go back to the, the, the law. You know, why, the, why there are uh, laws against uh, uh, people assaulting, those kinds of things, to discourage fighting, to discourage assaults, right? To, to discourage that kind of thing. So laws are one of those things that kind of remind us then, like, you know, if we're not, how well are we doing as a species, right? We don't have any laws that say, oh, you're going to go to jail because you've done too many kind things for people, right? We don't have those kind of laws, do we? No. Nope. Oh, sorry, you're too compassionate. You're going to get five years in jail. You know, so it just doesn't happen. All right. So with this, then, what we, uh, sorry. So what I propose to do today is some practices that help with dealing with reducing that level of negativity on this side and then bringing it to a place where it's, you know, it's, it's not as uh, dominant. And then to move our thinking and our, and our understanding and our feelings and emotions to this more positive side. So how do we do that? Well, there are practices to do that. And as I was showing today on my, during my keynote, 
there are a number of practices. And so what I want to do today is a practice called breath awareness. And another uh, one we'll do today is loving kindness. And I'm and three, we can do um, we'll call it mountain meditation. And four, we'll do belly breathing. We'll do these four practices today. So what we'll do is first talk about breath awareness to kind of give you an idea before we do the practice. And the first thing to know about breath awareness, well, I'm sorry, let me, let me do this here first. First thing we're going to do is intention. Why am I meditating, right? And I always do, when I do my practice, is I am meditating to to bring kindness in all that I do. That's one, one of my intentions I do. I'm meditating to bring kindness in everything that I do. Now, your, your intention is saying, I am meditating to be happier. I am meditating to feel a sense of safety or whatever it is. So if you've got a pencil in front of you, just write down your intention right now. I am meditating to, and you can put it on your cell phone notes too if you, you don't have your, if you don't have a pencil, just take your cell phone out, find your notes, and write in there. I am meditating to, whatever it is, and that's that's how um, it really, you know, increases the purpose of your meditation, is to uh, have an intention, right? I'm meditating to be the coolest person in the world, or something. Right? But I'm meditating, whatever it is, okay. So once you've got that written down, then we can go to the actual practice of breath awareness. So breath awareness is like this. Here's the in-breath. The in-breath is... here. Out-breath is here. So the in-breath, inhale, out-breath, exhale, to here. And at each one of these spots here, we just pause. There's a little pause before you do the in or out-breath. So in-breath is like, you know, begin like... We don't, we'll breathe through our nose. We we, we'll just use our uh, nostril breathing just first to begin with. So in breath, out breath. So we'll pause. So it's like circular breathing, right? Circular. Circular breath. So, um, and how to get started with this. Now, this is kind of just the practice how it is is to go ahead, put everything down, put your stuff down, sit up straight. We're going to get into the practice now. Okay? And just go ahead and put your hands on your laps. You can put them, fold them in your laps. You can just put them like here. Get your body nice and straight. And it's like you're sitting on a horse. You're kind of stepping into the saddle or you're sitting in a car or you're sitting in front of your machine at the casino. No, I'm just kidding. But you're squaring up, right? Nice and easy. Hands there. Hands relaxed. 
And before you do anything, what I want you to do is just kind of move your neck around. Just relax and roll your neck easily. Roll your shoulders, same time. Just roll them. If you need to, bring your arms over your head. Take a nice deep breath. Down again. Move your hips and your sides. So you're going to go on just a little bit of a journey here. And when you're ready, just go ahead and close your eyes. Sit up straight, hands in your laps, and take a nice deep breath. Cleansing breath in, cleansing breath out. Let's do two more of those. Breath in, nice deep breath in. Just relaxing as you breathe in. Not so quick, not so slow. Breathing out, let it go. And one more. And now settle into your seat. The idea now here is to see your breath, right? You want to see your breath on the outside as you're seeing it. You're imagining it coming in as you're breathing in, touching your nose, and like the circle in the in-breath, you're going around, pausing, and then the out-breath. In-breath. Out-breath. Okay. Now just do this several times. Stick with it. Nothing to do but just do what's natural, and that's breathe. So as you breathe in, allow yourself to feel a sense of relaxation, a sense of calm in your body, in your mind. Notice where you're feeling your breath the most. Maybe you're feeling it in your belly, in your chest and ribs. Maybe you're feeling it in your shoulders. And if any thoughts come up while you're breathing, just simply say to yourself, thoughts. And go back to your in-breath and out-breath. If any emotions or feelings come up, the same thing. You just say emotions when an emotion comes up, or say feelings when a feeling comes up, and then just go back to your breathing. Now as you're breathing, just feel how that breath is circulating in that circular motion on the in-breath, coming in, coming in, coming in, and then pausing and then going out, going out, going out, all in a circle. Same thing. Repeat again, breathing in, breathing in, breathing in, and breathing out, breathing out, breathing out, breathing out. And you might notice your hands, how your hands feel. You might notice how they're touching your lap, or they're touching the desk, or they're touching one another. You might notice how it feels to be sitting in this chair as you're breathing in. You feel the chair supporting you, how your legs and your bottoms touch the chair. Maybe you're feeling your feet for the first time today, and you're really noticing how your feet feel today. Maybe you're just noticing the content in your head. And whatever it is, you just pay attention to it just for a moment. And then you go back to your breathing. In breath, cleansing breath. Out breath, cleansing breath. And if it's helpful to you as you breathe in, you can say, breathing in. As you breathe out, breathing out. And you just gently and calmly say that to yourself to remind yourself that you're in this safe space 
this place you're creating, a special place, feeling the breath of life, the flow of life, Maybe so you're noticing how quiet the room is right now as you're breathing in and breathing out. Maybe you're noticing how peaceful it is right now where you're sitting. Those things are all fine. But as soon as you remember, let's go back to the breathing. Breathing in, breathing in, breathing in. And then breathing out gently, breathing out, breathing out. This is your little vacation away from everything, away from the noise, the negative thoughts. No one wants you to do anything. You don't have to be anything right now. You just have to, or it's just important to enjoy your breath. And if you enjoy it, smile. Okay, now I'm going to bring you out of out of this practice. So I want you just to keep on breathing, maintaining your sense of composure and balance, sense of well-being. And I'm going to count down from five to zero. And as I count down, just maintain your breathing and just focus on your breath. The counting is just a small guide. And when I reach zero, I want you to, when you're ready, gently and slowly open your eyes. And don't move. Just hold your gaze in front of you, the first thing that you see. The main thing is to stay relaxed and composed and stay aware of your breath. Five, four, three, two, stay composed, one, maintaining a sense of relaxation, zero, And when you're ready, you can slowly open your eyes, slowly open them, come back to the space of the room, the reality of the room. Okay. When you're ready, um, turn to the person next to you or Join a group and just talk about how that felt. How was that for you? So. So let me ask you this. How was that? How was it? Relaxing? Relaxing. Uh, I was made me so comfortable. I wanted to go to sleep. Okay. okay. See some yawns. I see some yawns in the crowd. <laughs> you know what's happening with your brain is that it goes from, like, my brain is probably, well, maybe not quite anymore, but in, in the beta state, which means it's kind of like talking and teaching and stuff. The next level is an alpha, which kind of modulates less, more relaxed, right? Then you get down to even to another level of sleep or relaxation in the brain. I think it's theta gets even bigger like this. And then the last one is the delta, which is like, oh, no dreaming, just very deep sleep where 
sleepwalking happens sometimes, right? Different things happen in these different brain levels. So you're moving into a lower into a lower level of alpha. It means you're getting more relaxed. Your heart rate's slowing down. Your blood pressure's going down, right? Your bills are going away. I'm kidding. So. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and you're and um, you're feeling more relaxed, right? So that's what breath awareness is. So it's always like your intention of meditating to bring kindness in, in all that I do. So I was like in breathing, out breathing, the circular pattern. Did anyone have trouble sort of maintaining it or where your brain got too flooded with all too many things to do? Some, yeah, a few folks? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, you'd stop, right? Yeah. 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 It's really disrupted breathing is really a sign of stress, right? It's like it's like you're stop breathing, right? It's kind of like a being awake apnea, right? It's like stop breathing because you're getting overwhelmed, right? So that's breath awareness, okay? So I want to do another practice with you. And this one is, um, let me do this here. Take a picture of this here. Because I added one more. I don't know if we're going to get a chance to do this last one. but um, Loving kindness. So loving kindness is about, is about you know, um, kindness to yourself giving love to yourself, caring about yourself. Right? But it's also about this. The first person you practice loving kindness with is, we'll say, um, well, let's, let's kind of go on what it is. Loving kindness is may blank be loved. Right? May blank be happy. So what that means then is four situations. The first one, A, is someone that you love, right? Someone you care about. Someone innocent, right? Like a baby or your child or someone you really care about, right? You say, may, let's say, uh, let's, uh, I'll just use the name Sam, right? May Sam be loved your little grandson Sam or your nephew or whatever or your your child or your you know your partner or whatever may Sam be happy right that's the first one so the second one is um, someone you don't know and that someone you don't know could be like the mail lady who delivers your who delivers your mail. Yeah, I don't know the mail lady, but you know, may the mail lady be loved. May the mail lady be happy, right? So the third one, then, is yourself. May I be loved. May I be happy, right? And the hardest one to do is someone that is difficult for most people, right? Someone that you may have a lot of difficulty with, right? People say, may, let's say Sam, you had a really hard time with Sam, right? May Sam be loved. And most people can say, I don't want Sam to feel loved. After all Sam did to me, hell with Sam, you know. But that's the, that's the hard part about it. Because when you begin to give that space of love to another person, you begin to let go. You don't carry that burden. It's like it's done, right? Still holding resentment. May Sam, be happy, right? Oh, I don't want all that misery that they caused me, right? You're carrying that burden. Mindfulness helps us to release that, to let go, right? And pretty soon, the neurons fire differently. That doesn't rent space in your brain anymore, that person or that incident, whatever it is. So let's go ahead and try this practice. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, let's try that practice. Skip, let's get back to our seating position again. Call, I call it uh, assume the position, nice and 
relax, like get back on your horse or sit in your chair, your hands on your lap, shoulders relaxed, and start your nice cleansing breath in, letting go of everything, cleansing breath out, cleansing breath in, cleansing breath out. And now you have someone to think about. May think about who is that person now. You say that to yourself. May so and so be loved on the in breath. The out breath. May so and so be happy. Right? Remember it's someone you already really care about. And you might want to visualize them being happy. Visualize them being loved. But you're giving this to them at this time. And you're giving of yourself at this time. And maybe it makes you smile because you're giving love and happiness and asking that for someone. Pleasant feeling. It's okay to smile. It's very natural. And you're just gently again repeating, may so-and-so be loved, may so-and-so be happy. Now, just to gently shift your awareness, let's do it for yourself. May I be loved. May I be happy. Let's give love to yourself. Give love and happiness to yourself. May I be loved on the in-breath. May I be happy on the out-breath. And again, it helps when you smile. There's nothing wrong with smiling to feel a sense of happiness, to feel a sense of love. Again, this is a place where you're sitting in this special place, not judging your experience, not judging yourself, saying, oh, I can't be happy. Oh, I can't be loved. I don't deserve it. That's not part of the exercise. The exercise is just to allow yourself this opportunity to give this to yourself in this place that's safe, that's secure, that's sacred in your own spot right now. No one is asking anything of you. There are no demands on your time. Nothing to do but just to breathe in. May I be loved. Breathing out. May I be happy. And now gently shifting your awareness, let's go to that difficult person. In your mind's eye, I want you to see this person. It shouldn't be too difficult a person, but it's a person who's difficult, right? If it's too difficult, it's a very hard exercise. But maybe someone that's difficult. Again, seeing this person and saying, may so-and-so be loved. Breathing out, may so-and-so be happy. And this is the difficult person.
It's not about judgment or attachment to any situation or anything that's happened. You're just giving yourself an opportunity to unload, to let go, to liberate yourself from this relationship of this difficult person by loving kindness. May so and so be loved. May so and so be happy. Okay, we're going to just shift our attention just gently to come out of this practice now. And the same thing, I'm going to count it from 10 this time. So I want you to continue just breathing. And let's shift back to yourself. May I be loved on the in-breath. May I be happy on the out-breath. And again, as I count, just maintain your sense of relaxation, your sense of balance in your chair, your sense of feeling a wellness. Ten. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. And again, just maintaining a sense of not getting tight or not getting tense, but just remain relaxed. Four. Three, two, and one. And when you're ready, you can gently, slowly open your eyes. Just holding your awareness for a moment. Still breathing. Hey, so let's try the same drill again. Turn to someone near you and talk about what this experience was like. What is loving kindness? What is, it's also called metta. That's what the Buddhists call it, metta. But it's the, the, the kindness. You're putting kindness to yourself, to yourself or out to others. What was that like? Or you don't have to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> How was that like? So how was that, folks? Anybody want to volunteer to say how that was? You can just speak up if you want. How was it? Relaxing. Was it difficult to do the last one? Or did you think about anyone that was difficult? Yeah. Yeah? How was that? How did that feel? Was it, was it easy to let go? Was it hard to let go? Or to let some, yeah, hard to let go of someone who you, like, gave you a hard time or something was difficult in your life? Or, you know, that's the way we are. We don't want someone, you can't be happy, what you did to me, right? Kind of thing. That's kind of how we carry that burden around, right? So as we practice this more and more, and we go to more and more difficult situations, again, I want to just remind you that what it really what it's about is to kind of, it's a process of letting go, process of liberation. Now, if you can imagine working with people, which you all can, that have uh, very difficult lives, substance abuse and addictions and stuff, 
If you can imagine what they must be thinking about themselves, right? How difficult it is for them to love themselves. And they probably don't believe anyone loves them or cares about them or is ever going to extend any loving kindness to them because of all the hell that they raised, all the things that they've done, right? Can you imagine, again, carrying that kind of burden if you're that person? And that's what loving kindness is about, is putting ourselves in the shoes of others to understand that people did things because they were affected by something, right? Most people don't wake up one day and say, gosh, I woke up today, I'm going to decide to hurt somebody. I'm going to decide to be mean to everybody. I'm going to decide to be an alcoholic. I'm going to decide to be this or that. Most people don't wake up to do that. It's a process that comes throughout life. And people end up in a circumstance where, you know, they have very, very difficult emotions, very, very difficult attachment with others, with themselves. And so that's what loving kindness practices are all about. It's beginning with the easiest person to give love to. They're no threat to you. They're easy to love. Then the next person, again, the male lady or the male man or whoever, you know, easy to kind of say this. Then to yourself, because it's difficult sometimes for us to give love and compassion to ourselves. And then, of course, the last person is that person we have difficulties with, right? But just to, again, to remind, if we have difficulty with a person, we have not dealt with that. That's a baggage you carry. And you'll get up every morning and pack it up and put it back on, carry it around, right? Loving kindness helps us to release that. So just because of time, I want to do this last practice. It's called the body scan. How many people here practice meditation at all? So a couple folks, a couple, three folks? Yeah, OK, good, good. This last body scan, then, is uh, a guided one. It's very guided. This one's much more guided. And what you're doing is you're kind of checking in to all parts of your body. And as you check into all parts of your body, I'm going to ask you to you know, relax that part of your body you know, as, as you scan it. Again, why are you meditating? I am meditating to, okay, before you start the practice, I always say that to yourself. I am meditating in order to, right? Okay, let's do the body scan now. Let's go again. We'll finish up with this practice. And let's go ahead and just find our seat again. Let's stand up just for a sec. Everyone stand up for a sec. Stretch just a bit. And we'll do this last practice. It's been a long day, you've been sitting a long time. <laughs> okay. And whenever you're ready, just go ahead and take a chair again, take a seat. So the body scan, before we start, what it's about is that you follow my voice wherever I tell you to go. Your big toes, your thumb, your heel your belly, your spine, your brain, your ears, your sinuses, wherever. I'm going to lead you on a little scanning of all these parts of your body. You're going to get in touch with them. And again, you might want to think about loving kindness, how you want to put loving kindness to each part of this body, your, your body, right? We don't normally do that. We don't pay attention to our bodies like that. Okay? So let's go ahead and start again with just uh, getting to our regular positions. Again, just couple nice big deep breaths just to kind of let go of any tension and just feel relaxed. Give yourself a moment just to feel relaxed. Feel good. Feel a sense of hope, sense of wellness. Now let's begin by turning your attention to the very bottom of your feet. If your feet are flat on the floor, just feel your soles in touch with your socks and your shoes or the floor. Just scanning the bottom of your feet. A lot of times we don't pay any attention to the bottom of our feet till they really ache. Then moving our attention just slowly upward to all of our toes Moving from the left side to toes, slowly to each toe, scanning each toe, all the way to the big toe, and then moving to the right side, starting with the big toe on the right side, 
scanning down to each toe, <clears throat> and then moving your attention to the top part of your foot. How does the top part of your foot feel? Tension? Does it feel a sense of tiredness? Whatever it is, just note it. And then moving your attention to your ankles and to your heels. Just scanning your ankles, your heels, feeling any tension, tightness in there. And then slowly, slowly beginning at the front of your leg, front of your each shin. Go up on the left side, the right side, the shins just scanning upward, slowly through all the bone, all the muscle, all the way to the knees. Arriving at the knees, let your attention scan both knees, circular, circulating around both knees. And then returning your attention to the heels on both feet, moving slowly to your Achilles tendon, all the way up your calves, all the way to the bottom of your knees, and stopping there. And then moving your attention from your knees on the top part of your legs, scanning and releasing any tension in your quads, in the front of your legs, just scanning your muscle, the bones, the tendons, and then turning your attention to the back of your knees, slowly scanning the back of your legs, your hamstrings, slowly moving through the muscle, moving through the tendons, through the bone, moving your attention all the way to your hips, moving past your bottoms, all the way to your hips. Same thing on the top, moving your attention awareness to your hips. And then scanning both hips, moving your attention and awareness to both hips, noticing any tension, any feelings in each hip, allowing the hips to relax, the muscles and the tendons around the hips to relax. You've been sitting all day. Then moving your attention now to your bottoms and the back of your legs. As you notice how they're, they feel touching your chair, scanning right where your legs touch the chair, all the way on your bottoms, moving up, moving up, all the way to where your spine begins, all the way to the, your lower back. And the same thing, moving your attention to both knees and the front of your quads again, moving forward and moving up to your hips, and then moving your attention to your lower abdomen, your stomach there, noticing any tension in your lower back or the lower part of your stomach. <clears throat> then moving your attention again back to the lower part of your back, moving up slowly of your back, noticing any tightness, any feelings as you move slowly to the middle part, all the way up to your upper back, to your shoulders, and just stopping there. Noticing the front now, moving from the lower abdomen in the front through your belly, past your belly button, moving the middle part of your belly, past the ribs, to your chest, all the way up to your shoulders, scanning and noticing anything that you feel anytime you're scanning. Moving your attention now to your right hand, to all your fingers, scanning your thumb, your pointer finger, your middle finger, your ring finger, and your little finger, and then moving your attention through your knuckles, through your tendons, all the way to your wrist, noticing anything there, scanning up your forearm, all the way to your elbow and the back of your forearm, and then to your tricep, the back of your arm and your bicep muscle, all the way to your shoulder, just relaxing that part of your body. Same thing on your left side, scanning the thumb, the pointer finger, the middle finger, the ring finger and little finger, scanning up all those fingers to your wrist, just noticing any tension and letting the tension go in the body, scanning up your forearms all the way to the elbow. Again, just seeing the tension leave, getting to the elbow and moving up to the bicep and the tricep, slowly releasing the tension all the way to the shoulders. And from the shoulders, from the back of the shoulder, move up slowly to the back of your neck, to the back of your scalp, and moving your attention 
and awareness and scanning the top, the back of your skull, slowly to the top of your skull, bringing in your ears and your hearing, and then moving your attention to the front of your skull and your face, moving your awareness down to the forehead now, relaxing the forehead so there are no lines there anymore, relaxing the eyes so that the eyes feel calm, moving your attention through your sinuses, relaxing and opening up the sinuses, moving your awareness through your throat, relaxing your tongue, relaxing your lip, relaxing your smile. And now moving your attention now down into your throat, all the way down your throat, into your lungs, relaxing and scanning your lungs and your heart, bringing your attention and expanding it to include your liver and your kidneys and your pancreas and your intestines and your belly, relaxing your belly, scanning your belly. Moving your attention now all the way to the back where your spine begins at the top of your shoulders from the bottom of your scalp, your skull, moving down your spine slowly, all the way down the spine through all the nerves, relaxing the nerves in your body, relaxing all those nerves that come from your spine and spread throughout, spread throughout your whole body, spreading through the body, giving those nerves time to relax as you reach all the way down your spine to your tailbone. And now I want you to see your body all scanned and allow yourself then to feel a sense of relaxation in all these areas, just breathing in relaxation to every part of the body that you've scanned, beginning at the feet and moving up, relaxing, to the legs, to the upper body, to the arms and shoulders, to the throat, to the head, and scanning now finally through the brain, scanning through the brain, relaxing the brain, liberating the brain, calming the brain, just allowing the brain to feel a sense of relaxation. And as you breathe in, breathing in deep relaxation, you say to yourself, breathing out a sense of calm. In breath, deep relaxation, out breath, calm. And just go ahead and hold this just for a minute to enjoy this moment, to enjoy this feeling of having visited all of your body, scanning all your body, meeting your body, taking care of your mind, taking care of your body. And when you're ready, you're going to slowly and gently open your eyes, come back to the awareness of the room.